Morning, everybody. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 10. Good to be with you this morning. I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to go ahead and say I miss Dr. Johnson. If he were here, I could talk to him about that Alabama game last night. <laughs> but alas, you don't want to hear about it. Well, we've come to the end of our 10th chapter. Can you believe it? We began, we began it in January. And we're, Lord willing, we're concluding it in uh, September. So God has been good uh, to get us to this point. Uh, you'll notice uh, in your Bible, chapter 11, uh, we'll begin with some instruction about prayer that Jesus gives to his disciples. I have this unfortunate habit of scribbling notes in my uh, Bible. And uh, the result, after doing this for years, is I have something like my own uh, study Bible, the Newman Study Bible, uh, and uh, with various notes. Uh, the key, uh, if you have a habit like this, I'm not lecturing you, but the key is to be judicious in what you put in here and not put everything in, uh, just things that help you, uh, help clarify uh, things help with the interpretation. And as I've been looking at this uh, section of the gospel, uh, I've, I've got these notes uh, in the margin. They're very helpful. You know, m normally they come from hearing someone teach, uh, hearing Dan, hearing a Sunday school teacher, um, hearing someone at the Lord's Supper uh, meeting. And I've been looking, uh, it's an outline and I wondered, where did I get that? But I listened to Dan's message this week. That's where I, I, I got it. But uh, it's pretty good. Uh, next to verse 30, uh, I, I wrote the need to love. And that's a, a good summary of, of what we studied last time with the Good Samaritan. Uh, today, uh, next to verse 38, it says the need uh, to learn. Uh, and that's a pretty good description, I think, of, uh, I'm not downplaying Dan's choice of that title, but that's a good description of what we're going to look at today. And then next to uh, chapter 11, verse 1, the need to pray. So uh, uh, that's a general outline of what we've been through and where we're uh, going. Uh, so, but pondering those three subject headings, the need to love, the need to learn, the need to pray, it occurred to me uh, that all three of those imperatives or, or priorities receive a good deal of attention uh, from the pulpit and from the lecterns uh, at Believer's Chapel. Not a surprise since we've made reading and teaching uh, the Bible a priority in our church's overall uh, structure of what we do, our conduct, and the Bible as a whole uh, lays great emphasis on these spiritual uh, uh, disciplines. Now, uh, though Luke was a able historian, uh, he did not allow historical chron chronology to handcuff him. And consequently, as one reads along with his account, cer certain themes emerge with lessons that stand alone and are not necessarily dependent on what came before or comes after. But we may say that, generally speaking, we are in a lengthy section of the gospel that finds the Lord uh, making uh, his uh, way uh, ultimately to Jerusalem. We know that. Uh, the section began roughly in the ninth chapter with verse 51, with Luke's declaration that when the days were approaching for Jesus' ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and it concludes in the 19th chapter with his triumphant entry into uh, the city. Uh, Jesus was accompanied by his uh, disciples as uh, they journeyed. And so we read in verse 38, of chapter 10, now as they were tra traveling along, he entered a village 
and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted. Very interesting word, we'll talk about it some. Martha was distracted with all her preparations and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And so there's our theme, uh, the good part, and we will want to attempt to understand what just, what G just what Jesus meant by that. But the occasion for this little vignette is unremarkable. It was while they were traveling along that they entered this unidentified village and into the home of Martha and Mary. And that's Luke's opening reminder to his readers. This was a journey with some significance. And now he presents to us a respite of sorts from their travels. It's likely a precarious thing to try to speculate too deeply into our Lord's consciousness on this journey, but we can imagine that uh, just as he had grown physically and mentally in the years uh, leading up to his public ministry, uh, so his awareness of his mission and the road ahead would have continued to be engraved and impressed upon his thoughts as he traveled. Uh, Jesus must have experienced a steadily increasing burden of soul uh, the closer uh, he came to his final destination. And the home of Martha and Mary made for a comfortable and friendly pause. Luke does not identify the name of the village, but we know it is Bethany. It was very near Jerusalem, uh, only a couple of miles or so away on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Luke's design in chronicling the Lord's progress toward Jerusalem uh, perhaps factored into his decision to omit the specific name of the town at this point. Uh, maybe he didn't want to get ahead of himself in, in the flow of his account. But the other gospel writers uh, make mention of Bethany as a frequent destination for our Lord. But it's John who names it specifically in John 11 verse 1 as the village of Mary and her sister Martha and their brother Lazarus. And he adds in the fifth verse of chapter 11, after John chapter 11, after uh, Jesus had learned of the critical illness that had befallen his dear friend uh, Lazarus, uh, we learn that Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Uh, that made this a special home for the Lord and therefore uh, Bethany a, a special village to him, a place of retreat and even rejuvenation. Back in chapter 9, verse 58, Jesus had uh, informed a would-be follower of his that the foxes have holes and the birds of the uh, air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere uh, to lay his head. In Bethany, an exception of sorts uh, was made for him. But here Luke gives us our first introduction to this loving family. Martha is named uh, first, uh, as she is in almost every instance. The one exception to that being that first verse of John chapter 11, where Bethany is cited as the village of Mary and her sister uh, Martha. But there uh, Mary is initially named because John goes on to describe her as the one who had anointed a Jesus with that expensive perfume. So he opens with uh, Mary. Uh, Martha may have been 
the older of the two. She certainly acts like an older sister uh, in her appearances here. And in John's gospel, she is portrayed as the initiator in uh, hospitality with a take charge uh, personality. Luke states that she welcomed Jesus into her home and then he describes her busy activity in preparation for a meal for her guests. In her appearance in John 12, she is the same. Uh, Jesus has arrived at their home. A supper is prepared and Martha is the one described as uh, doing the serving. But before that even, in the 11th chapter of, of John, after Lazarus had uh, fallen deathly ill, it is Martha whom John describes, remember, as hearing that Jesus was on his way there and rushing out uh, to meet him. While John says Mary stayed at the house. She was likely uh, voluble, uh, which is to say she wasn't bashful in expressing her opinions or giving voice to her feelings. When she met up with Jesus as he made his way to their home, she uh, blurted out, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have uh, died. And here in our passage, it's Martha who speaks or, or, or rather complains. Uh, we might be justified in calling her Peter's female counterpart in the Gospels. Mary, on the other hand, appears uh, more measured uh, in every respect, perhaps even pensive at the Lord's presence in their home. After Martha had welcomed Jesus uh, into their home, Luke reports that she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. Now that was the typical posture in the rabbinic world of a rabbi's uh, disciple, a student. So there is significance in the description. Uh, later in Acts 22, Paul would describe his own tutelage under the rabbi Gamaliel as having been educated at the feet of uh, Gamaliel. Mary had chosen to be there uh, with that attitude, uh, even though such a scene was rare at the time. It was quite unusual for a woman to be accepted by a teacher as his disciple, and official Judaism uh, decried such a practice. So this is an example of how Jesus ignored the petty and irrelevant strictures that the scribes and Pharisees uh, focused on and instead encouraged purity of heart in all, male, female, freedman, slave, all who would follow after him. That's a side point, though, uh, to the lesson. Uh, the emphasis in Luke's telling is on Mary's choice in being there. She had her priorities in line. Above all, she wanted to hear what her Lord was saying, so she had made the time to be where she was. She had made the time to be there. We shouldn't think that the demands upon the time of Mary and Martha were that different than they are for each of us today. Every day, at every stage, we tend to be pulled in every direction as the time we have is precious to us. We talk about that a lot. Uh, how, how are things going? Busy, busy, yeah. I wish I had more time to do the things that I need to do. I wish I had more time to do the things I wanted to. Well, Mary uh, took the time, or more likely made uh, the time to soak up Jesus' teaching and breathe in every word. She took full advantage of her opportunity. So she appears as one eager to learn, certainly. We, we must... Uh, at least say that, she was eager uh, to learn. But more than that, uh, the, the way I read it, uh, with Mary not just there at his feet listening, but also resisting the pull of other things 
uh, or the condemnation that was about to come to her. She was enamored with Jesus and, and could not but be absorbed in him to the exclusion of all other things. She was devoted to her Savior, to Jesus. This matches the description of her in John chapter 12, that other place in the Gospels in which we find Jesus in their home. This one, a more poignant occasion for the passion of Christ is nearer still uh, there. And then in the opening verses of chapter 12, again, uh, Martha is serving. I wish we had time to go through, but you can go back and Look, there again, Martha is ser serving, but it is Mary uh, now, uh, not simply fixated once more on the Lord, but pouring out the costly nard perfume on his feet and on his head, anointing him, even wide, wiping his feet with her hair. It's as if every time that we see this woman, see Mary in the Gospels, there she is in that posture prostrate before the Lord, absorbed in Him, and choosing Him over all other things. That costly perfume was more than just a very expensive possession she had. It was like a priceless uh, heirloom. And as Judas, you remember this, objects at the supposed extravagance of her actions, Jesus praises her for she alone, He said, seemed to understand Listen, she, was, she alone seemed to understand that she was anointing him for his burial. It was the culminating fruit, we might say, of those times before when she had dropped everything to attend to what she believed was the most important thing, hearing her Lord speak and teach and explain and minister to her. Uh, but then there's Martha. That's how verse 40 begins. But Martha. It's never a flattering comparison when you're on the but side of the comparison. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. Now there were many uh, ways in uh, there are many ways in which a person can be described as being distracted. The sudden loud noises uh, distract. Nothing like a crack of thunder uh, to, to rock your world and get you off course. Uh, voices in the background uh, dis distract. But the word Luke uses here has a meaning pointing to a distinct category of distraction. It means to be actively pulled or dragged away from something else uh, with the consequence that one is distracted from what he was previously attending to or now too busy uh, to attend to that matter. Uh, that, so that implies, I think this is true, that implies that Martha likely wanted to hear uh, Jesus uh, but was prevented from doing so by the pressure of providing the kind of hospitality that was the trademark of the typical hostess of that era. I think we can say with some confidence, Martha wanted to, she wanted to be there too. That yearning was in her to, to be in there with her sister. There, were, there was much to be done. Uh, it seems apparent that their guest was not Jesus alone, but also the disciples traveling uh, with him. We could add some more probably, hangers on, not hangers on, but people that were with them. Uh, there was probably a, a good group. And so there were many to prepare for. In addition to making their home presentable for a guest, there was food to prepare. This resonates, I think, with many of you. <laughs> you understand uh, what was going on in the, in the home, uh, food uh, to uh, prepare, uh, places uh, to, to set, um, jugs of water, bowls to clean the traveler's uh, feet 
uh, as they came and, 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 and made themselves at home there. It was a good thing for Martha to have all those things in mind. Uh, I've seen it, you've seen it. It's good uh, what, what happens when someone's coming for company. Um, so it was good. Uh, one might have thought her rude otherwise. We might even say her heart was in the right place. But what all these burdens of hospitality were doing was drawing her attention away from this golden moment when the Lord Jesus was in her home, engaged not in idle conversation, but in teaching the Word, His Word. And they all knew by this point it was unlike any word they had ever heard. The result for Martha, she chose the good over the better, or more accurately, the best. The Bible's full of illustrations of God's good people who chose the good over the best. Uh, Lot, Abraham's uh, nephew, is one of the more colorful characters found in the Bible, always getting himself into messes. Uh, Peter called him righteous Lot in 2 Peter 2, verse 7. So we know that despite some of his eventual failures, he was one of God's uh, people. But his sad demise, Lot's sad demise, as recorded in the book of Genesis, began with what might have seemed like a good decision to choose the more fertile lands uh, toward Sodom and, and to part from his truly righteous relative Abraham. It wasn't bad thinking necessarily. It just pulled him away. Here's this word. It just pulled him away from uh, places where blessing awaited. He was distracted uh, more and more uh, the further one reads in the Genesis account. The Apostle Paul uh, attracted many uh, friends and fellow workers who assisted him in his service to the Lord, but his epistles, Paul's epistles, describe a steady stream of co-workers who left him, uh, some for sinful pursuits, but others surely for what seemed at first to be innocent uh, reasons. Demas was one. Uh, you know, Demas is mentioned in three of, of Paul's epistles. He's described as his fellow worker. Uh, but eventually, uh, Paul informed Timothy of this, that Demas had deserted him, having loved this present world. I doubt that Demas uh, just simply woke up one day and decided, you know, I love this present world. I'm going to do that instead. But it began with him choosing things maybe that were good in and of themselves. They were okay things, while unknowingly forfeiting uh, the best things. He wasn't the only one, Demas. Uh, Paul adds later in 2 Timothy, at my first defense, no one supported me, all deserted me. But we can find our own illustrations uh, in our everyday lives, what good things distract us. I won't beat you up with naming uh, all those things, but of course we hasten to say that if anything distracts us from our fellowship with the Lord Jesus, they're not good things, they're bad things. But it is those things which are in and of themselves good things that may eventually you know, transmogrify into the idols that capture our attention so that we drift away from the best life of love for the Lord and service uh, to Him. The life that leads to joy is altered to one that is empty and of little use to God. Uh, Martha was certainly, we've seen that in our church, haven't we, over the years? Where is he? <laughs> Where are they? Did they die? No, they're just gone. Not to another church. They're just gone. 
Well, Martha was certainly not what we would call a bad person or, or especially wayward. No, but her attention was drawn away from the feet of her Lord by the burden of her duties, the burden of the lesser things. They became magnified in her obsession over them, and as she continued along, without the help of her sister, her younger probably sister, her frustrations uh, bubbled over, and she came up to Jesus, and she complained, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. It was a rebuke to her sister, and it was a rebuke to Jesus. As she had been toiling away, the, the, the hearing the voice of her Lord in, in the other uh, room, uh, and, the, and with the absence of anyone at her side to help in what she was doing to prepare a meal for him, combined, all that combined to set her smoldering. Kent Hughes described the scene. Martha was angry at Mary for being so selfish, and she was also mad at Jesus for allowing it to go on. She focused, if looks could kill glares upon Mary, and let out some pained sighs as she fussed over the table and loudly banged pots in the kitchen, a sure sign that something's not good in, in the kitchen. She was a type A, and she knew it. She was verbal. She was blunt. People always knew where they stood with her. Nothing like a little scolding to get things in order. So that was Kent Hughes' reenactment. But Martha had all her priorities uh, wrong. They were misaligned, so Jesus responded in verse 41 with a gentle correction. Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. It was certainly true that Martha was bothered. And I think some of us uh, here today can identify with her frustration you know, you're used to getting things done, uh, prioritizing them, organizing them, and then uh, checking uh, them off the list as they're, as they're completed. You are task-oriented, and you do not understand others who don't share your logic in this whole list-checking thing. How can they live like that? But that was not where the Lord was at that moment. He had on his mind much more important matters. Out of all the activities that compete for our time and attention, Jesus was saying, only one is absolutely necessary. It's what Mary has chosen to occupy her. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, uh, listening to him, adoring him, longing to know him in an ever more deeper way, discovering more and more his love for his own and the security that we have in him. All of that combined to make up what Jesus called the good thing. That's the good part. The one thing that is necessary and the only thing in creation that cannot be taken away from us. Well, reading this and, and pondering it uh, really uh, made me begin to think of something similar Jesus spoke in another place. It was in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus was exhorting his listeners there in Matthew 6, uh, to be careful not to sacrifice the best for the good. He said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't do that. Don't sacrifice the best for the simply good. 
let's be honest, we spend a great deal of time on earth storing up a treasure. It's mostly called work. Uh, sometimes it's called saving, uh, being good stewards, leaving an inheritance for our children, those that come after us. All of that is good. All of that's good. But ultimately, it's not the most important thing. That's what messes up people. I was about to say men, but today it's, it messes up people. Uh, they begin to think that their career, their job is the most important thing. And pretty soon they don't know their spouse. They're spending all their time on what started as a good thing, but ended up not so. It's not the most important thing. It's not the good part that Mary chose. And the Lord goes on there to say in Matthew 6, these treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And a little after that, you, 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 he goes on to say, don't be worried about your life as to what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or, or for your clothing. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added uh, to you. And that's the same Greek word the Lord used with Martha. Merimno, merimnao. Don't be worried. Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things. Only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. The good part is the treasure laid up in heaven. Don't you agree? That's the good part. It's the treasure laid up in heaven. And the word of the Lord has first claim on what will be our treasure. Where is your treasure? Let us make it sitting at the Lord's feet, feeding on his word. Let us make the word of God our first priority. Now, there's a, 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 a side lesson here for all of us churchgoers. That's a legitimate label for us, churchgoers. We are more than that, but we are church goers. As I look around this room, we're a bunch, we are church goers. We go to church and we get involved in the worship and activities and the goings on here. It's possible for us to get caught up in our duties here as well as, as Martha was that day in her home and, and neglect the essence of who God has made us and the worship he expects uh, from us. Let's not allow that to happen. That's why we, one of the reasons we emphasize the Lord's Supper uh, like we do. Some people think too much, but uh, we want us not to neglect the good part. Not that the ministry of the Word is not good. It certainly is. Uh, not that uh, missions and other things and serving are not good. They are, but there's the good part, sitting at Jesus' feet. Let's not allow that to happen, to substitute something uh, quite often good for the best. But let us join together figuratively with Mary at Jesus' feet, soaking up his word, uh, prostrate in adoring him. Now Martha comes off in something of a bad light in this passage, but I know each of us can see ourselves in her. Uh, she actually was quite the woman of faith. Jesus loved her to begin with, and she loved uh, him. Uh, you remember that scene in John 11. I mentioned it earlier. Lazarus had died. The Lord had bided his time, remember, uh, getting there. He heard that Lazarus had died, therefore he waited two days. Um, and um, he gets to Bethany, he's headed toward Bethany, and after being informed uh, that, uh, his, uh, uh, that he had died, and Martha, true to form, has come rushing out uh, to meet him on the way. 
uh, slightly scolding him, I think. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And that's when Jesus responded to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Do you believe this? He expanded on it, but he said, do you believe this? And Martha replied to the Lord with one of the great professions of faith found in the New Testament and one almost identical to Peter's at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew chapter 16. She said, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. I said she was Peter's uh, counterpart. Uh, perhaps they rubbed off of each other. Uh, certainly both uh, ultimately were pulled up by the Lord to the same level as Mary. They both eventually uh, chose the good part. Martha was no Demas. Well, may each of us understand and more and more uh, that it's the only thing truly necessary, the only thing which can never uh, be taken away from us is the good part. It's the good part. God, deliver us from distraction. Lead us to that good part where we will be found in the familiar posture of Mary at peace and content, free of anxious worry, finding our souls enriched by the communion we enjoy at Jesus' feet. You know, Mary enjoyed his physical uh, presence. We find him in his word with the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, telling us about him. Uh, we feed on him by the power of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling spirit. May God give us grace, as Paul says in another place, to keep in step with him. Let's close. Lord, thank you for uh, this example that we find in four verses in our Bibles, in your word. Uh, may we not be distracted, Lord, but keep, uh, keep reeling us in. Uh, keep reminding us of what is uh, truly the good part. Uh, keep us from distractions. Keep us from good things that become bad things uh, so that we might enjoy uh, fellowship with you and communion with our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.